Well, I am delighted to welcome back to World Outreach in Middle Tennessee, Eric Metaxas. And I'm delighted to be welcomed back. I love it here. Thank you. Good to have you in Hillbilly World. Oh, yeah, sure. (laughs) (laughs) You've got a new book, Letter to the American Church. You might as well jump right in. I I read a preview or at least a few chapters of it early, and it's, uh, it's an important book for right now. I have to say, I have absolutely never written anything like it. I've never written a book that I felt the Lord called me to write this now. I never, I've never done that before. I mean, I feel, you know, a sense uh, in everything I write that God wanted me to write it. But there's something about this book that's very different than anything I've ever written before. It's There's an intensity and an urgency to it. And I do not say that to sell books. I say that because that is the God's honest truth that where we are now is a horrible moment in in our history and that God is trying to get the church to speak, not to be silent. And I said, I, I, I absolutely have to write this to the best of my ability and say what I think the Lord wants to say, because it's not about what I want to say. Believe me, when you title something letter to the American church, you, you know, you don't want it to be what I think, because you're daring to, you know, sound like, you know, letter to the Philippians or letter to the, this is like, what, what does God want to say? So I took it really very seriously with tremendous humility, daring to write something like this and trying to get it right. So there you go. Well, I'm impressed because if, if you're watching this podcast, you, you can see the cover, but I want you to see the breadth of this book. You know, usually Eric writes these mammoth tomes. And you can read an Eric Metaxas book in one sitting. Yeah, maybe. And feel like an accomplished <laughs> human being. So I, that's- it's, it, it's, I mean, the, the thing is, it's dense. It's not like, well, I shouldn't say dense. I mean, I think it's re- very readable, but I, I, it's not, you know, these, these are not like stories or this is right. when you're writing a biography or writing these stories. This was a message that I felt I had to communicate this message to the church in America right now, you know, not like next year, now. You know, biblically, prophecy is not so much about foretelling who's going to win the lottery. Biblical prophecy is about what's God's perspective on what his people are doing. Yep. And I think in that sense, that's what this book does. It gives us a biblical perspective on what our lives look like. And it is, I love the quote on the front. It's like a cold bucket of water being thrown in the face of the church. We need that. And that's, you know, that's the esteemed Erwin Lutzer who, uh, you know, for him to say those kinds of things is, uh, uh, you know, I, I, um, I, I mean, I mean, look, I'll, I'll, I'll be blunt right from the start. Um, when I wrote my book on Bonhoeffer, What was that book about? It was ultimately about the story of how the German church was silent in the face of evil. And it's very easy for us to think like, well, we would never be silent in the face of evil. What what were were they thinking? These idiots. They Wrong. We are now, the American church now is being exactly silent in the face of similar evil. We have as many good excuses as they had. They were not evil people who we're silent in the face of evil. They just missed what what God was saying, and it led to a nightmare. And for us to think that, well, that could happen to them. It could never happen to us. That's arrogant. It's wrong. It's unbiblical. And what I'm saying in the book is it is happening this minute. If the church does not learn the lesson of Bonhoeffer now in America, we're going down that path. And there's no doubt in my mind, which is why I speak with just such incredible seriousness about it, because it's it's a horrifying thing to think about, but we better think about it. We better take it seriously. I, I, I could not agree with you more. You know, in the run-up to World War II, the churches, not just in Germany, but across Europe, were holding court as usual. They were having services. They were doing Easter and Christmas. They decorated their trees, um, fully aware of what was happening. That It wasn't hidden to them. It's one of the awkward realities of well, our history. I, I, w- I would say it's, it's, it's complicated. In other words, I actually think many of them, depending on where we're, where we're talking about, right? But you, you got a, a number of things going on. One example, and this is based on what you just said, early on, no one could dream 
of this evil that was coming. In other words, even though Bonhoeffer saw it and tried to warn them, they could not possibly imagine in our civilized country these kinds of things would happen. And then when it happened, even those that had some sense of it still couldn't believe it. They still stuck their head in the sand because it was just too much to face. And and that's kind of you you realize these were these were human beings, many of them serious Christians in the way that they're serious Christians today. So these weren't people that like had the attitude, ah, who cares? They purported to care, but they didn't care. And that's that's why I would say it would be arrogant of us to think, well, that that can't happen here. I, I in the book I say that it could and it is happening now. It's happening right now. So it's not, you know, when I was talking about stuff like this in the past, it was in the future. Now it's here. This is this is happening right now. And all you need to do is look around and everywhere you look, madness has broken over the heads of, you know, our fellow Americans. Well, by the time they got to Treblinka and Dachau and Auschwitz, yeah. and they're putting people in the ovens, that clearly is evil. But the run-up to that, right. the the critical biblical scholarship that flourished in the German universities and right. spread across Europe, oh boy, is really what it was the incubator Sorry. for the CRT we see today. That that that's exactly right. It's that same, and they were taking the authority of the Word of God out of their churches. It wasn't fashionable. That's right. They were deconstructing it. There wasn't one Isaiah. We had three Isaiahs. Then you certainly couldn't treat it as if it was some message to us. It was a historical something or other. Yeah. And those parallels to me yeah. are striking with the world we're living in. It's more fashionable to step apart from the word of God yeah. than to yield to its authority. Well, you I mean, you have a kind of spectrum of horrors, right? On the on the on the on the far left, theologically, which we've had for, you know, a hundred plus years, theological liberals who, as you just said, they've deconstructed the word of God to into meaninglessness. So that that has always existed. And that is a gigantic part of the problem. But you also have people that, you know, and look, the enemy, he doesn't care how he fools you. He doesn't need to fool you the same way twice. He doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. And so you have people um, uh, today in evangelical churches opening their doors to critical race theory and actually having what they think are good reasons for that. It's the worst thing imaginable, but they don't know. They, they don't seem to know, I should say. They don't seem to know that they're opening the door to the devil. They think they're doing something pious or healthy or whatever. So you have a spectrum of of uh, mistakes, errors, sins. And it is, it, it is, I guess, human nature, right? Let's just be honest. It is human nature for us to think we're different. That we're, we're not, we can't make the mistakes that they made back then because that was so obvious. Well, it wasn't obvious to them then. The Germans were a very civilized society, in many ways, very Christian. They missed it. So if they missed it, why wouldn't we miss it? Why would we dare to think that it is not something that could happen to us? So I, I do make the case that not only could it happen, it is happening. The very people today who say, I would have spoken up uh, in Wilberforce's day. Oh, it would have been very obvious. I would have been against the slave trade. That's total baloney. Most people in the churches did not. In fact, they told Wilberforce to shut up. Don't don't mix politics and faith. Don't mix faith. What's the matter with you? Just, you know, they said the same thing to Bonhoeffer. And basically people are saying the same thing now for similar and different reasons. You know, Eric, last week I had the opportunity, I was in Texas, and I got to speak to hundreds of pastors in a variety of meetings, encouraging them to have the courage to take their faith in the light of current events and talk about it. Our churches and pulpits can't be filled with theoretical theology. We've got to talk about what's happening through the windows of our church in the light of a biblical worldview. And candidly, I think a lot of people are afraid to do it. They're afraid of being canceled or labeled or attacked or fracturing communities, lots of reasons, but there's a lot of fear. Well, look, this is pretty simple. People have gotten this sick, unbiblical idea that they're only supposed to quote unquote preach the gospel. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't just preach the gospel. He spoke truth. Our, Our job is to speak truth 
on every issue to help people to process things because they are this minute. Look, they may already agree with, with you know, uh, John 316. I'm in. Done. Done. Is that it? Are we done? Do we go home? Is it time to go to brunch? Because we all, we are, Romans 13. Yep. Yep. I accepted him. I'm in. That's it. We are now supposed to help people process. Okay. Now that you know Jesus died for you and rose from the dead for you, now what are you going to do about it? How are you going to live that out? We have to help people understand that part of living that out means not being afraid to risk stuff because the Lord is with you. His Holy Spirit lives inside you and wants to use you to speak truth on every one of these issues. I mean, if you're talking about only quote unquote theology or whatever. Most people, they're, they're trying to figure out my kid is going to a school where the devils on the faculty are asking these kids, what are you today, a boy or a girl? That's child abuse. It is. Let's call it child abuse. It is evil. It is sick. If you can't speak that truth as a pastor, there are people in your congregation dying to know. What's going on, on on that issue? What's going on on all these other issues? So the reluctance of some pastors in a way to put meat on the bones to say, and by the way, uh, make sure you vote for somebody who believes the unborn is a human being. W- would you be afraid to say vote for somebody who is against the slave trade? Would you be, uh, w- would you, would you say, well, I can't comment on whether you should vote for somebody who is, uh, who is for killing Jews or for how do you, you can't avoid this stuff. So this, this, this crazy idea, this fantasy that we can avoid speaking about current events, it is crippling pastors. They don't know what they can talk about and their, their congregations are just dying to hear how does that book that you say is God's book, how does it relate to my life and to all these things that I'm facing and people are facing terrible things. So we, we are really, we're, we're living in such crazy times right now. And I think that's why I, I want to be super clear when I say the idea that, oh, you shouldn't talk about politics. You shouldn't about talk about current events. You don't, no, you're not supposed to make an idol of politics. You're not supposed to think that some politician is your savior and is going to solve your problems. But for you to say, all this stuff is out of bounds, I can't talk about this, that is not biblical. It is flat out not biblical. And it was exactly why the church in Germany went down the path that it did. They were silent exactly for the reasons that a lot of pastors are afraid to talk about this stuff right now. And I'm begging these pastors, please, please understand what happened then is happening now and God is calling you to understand why we have to do it differently. And if we don't, the same thing will happen. I know I'm repeating myself, but this is, I cannot, I, I, I beg people to try to see this. Well, I think we have to take it a step further. Don't sit in churches where they hide the truth. I've, I've said that many times. A participant. No, I've said that many times. A lot of people claim to me, well, my pastor's not really bold. It's like, well then, okay, maybe you need to find a place where the pastor is talking about this. Do you have a problem with that? Like, you know, life is short and, and, and we are all, uh, you know, it's all very easy to, to go with inertia, but I've had many people say that kind of thing. And I would say that, well, first of all, I, you know, you can give my book to that pastor and say, I'd like to discuss this with you, but you can also just find another church because this is honestly so urgent, uh, I, I want to say this again and again and again. The urgency, we don't have a few years. This is, mm-hmm. the, we're on borrowed time. We're on fumes now. It's not at the doorstep. It's in the building. Yeah. We have a major medical clinics in Middle Tennessee, celebrated clinics, teaching institutions that have opened departments to do gender transformation on minors. It's, it's as heinous as what Mengele was doing. It's evil. And the church We've is got silent. To have can, the courage can you to imagine? Say it. Can you imagine that the church is being silent on this? I just want to say, folks, I don't know who, where you got the bad idea that you're not supposed to comment on this, but it's not biblical. It's not God's will, and I just beg you to reconsider. This is, uh, it's everything. It's everything. So I'm assuming you wrote the book um, with the hope that it's a bit of a wake up call. <laughs> 
you yeah. know, resound the alarm one more time? Well, I, you know what I think, uh, honestly, um, I think, I, I, I think it's much worse now because we don't have the excuse. The German church in the thirties had the excuse that this had never happened before. So you could understand that they would imagine that this could never happen. We can see in the story of Bonhoeffer and what happened to the German church that this exactly this happened, how they missed it, how they said, we don't want to speak up yet. Romans 13, Romans 13, we don't want to, we don't want to go there yet. We don't get, and when they finally understood that we need to speak up, it was too late. So to me, the idea that in the United States of America today, where we have a tradition of the separation of church and state, where the church has been free, it hasn't been wedded to the government, where we have the freedom to speak and to be the voice uh, of those with, who have no voice. And it, we have infinitely less excuse than the German church. And I really think that the Lord in his infinite mercy gives us the Bonhoeffer story as a warning to us to say, okay, this will happen to you unless you get this lesson, un unless you see what happened here and have the humility to repent and to speak now on all these issues. There are innumerable millions of people looking to the church for wisdom on, you know, transgender craziness on, is it good to have borders? Is it, I mean, whatever it is, people are looking to the church saying, things look like they're falling apart. They're crazy. What, what, what am I missing? Help me process this. And you have innumerable pastors saying, oh, no, 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 I, I don't want to do that. I might lose my job or people might get offended and leave the church. And I think to myself, are you kidding? Do you, you don't fear a holy God that he has given you the, the, He's charged you with speaking the truth and you're kind of thinking, well, maybe not yet. Maybe not yet. I, I don't want to let somebody else bring it up. That is, that's a chilling thing. And, and it, it chills me to think about it, but that, that's kind of where we are. Well, you're a little kinder than I want to be for a moment. I don't disagree with your history. But the German church in the 30s or the European church, to me, is not an aberration. When you say that they didn't understand or they didn't see, they should have. We have a biblical narrative. Right. This was not the first time the church had wandered into the weeds or God's people had well, wandered into the weeds. Well, that's correct, yes. You know, I read Josiah. He comes to be a king when he's a boy. And on the Temple Mount, they have shrine prostitutes. Right. And they have altars to the Canaanite fertility gods. So there's a whole infrastructure supporting that. There's a whole group of people in society right. supporting that. Right. And he says, we're going to tear this down. So, I mean, and that pattern is repeated over and over, both Th biblically that's, no, and that's through right. the history of the that's church. That's exactly right. It, exactly. I, I've spent my life in the church, so I can speak to this a little different perspective. Yeah. When the church leaders refuse to engage the uh, authority of Scripture— the simple teachings of Scripture, and to teach those to the people. Mm. We betray the confidence that we've been entrusted with. And judgment comes. It's it's come over and over and There's, over again. That, right. Now, that's basically what I write about in the book, is this idea that we kind of act like, but that can't happen to us. It will happen. And you think, well, why? what are you talking about? I mean, Bonhoeffer was trying to wake up the German church, and, you know, he's pointing back to, uh, he's, he's pointing back to the old, Testament prophets. He, he He's pointing back to revelation. You know, I will remove, unless you repent, I will remove your candlestick. And the people in the Old Testament times, the people in the New Testament times, the they always act like, well, that can't happen here. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And it happens over and over and over again. In the Bonhoeffer case, it's so dramatic that he, he preaches a sermon. It's a, one of the early chapters in the book. Reformation Day, 1932, at this extraordinary church. I mean, you know, to get an invitation to be in the pulpit in that church in Berlin on Reformation Day. And he lets them have it and basically says, unless you repent. He's speaking this to the German church months before Hitler takes total power. And they blew it off. And what I say in that chapter is that almost like in, in, in the clearest, most heavy-handed way imaginable, 
judgment falls literally on that church. 10 years later, 11 years later, the uh, Allied forces bomb uh, Berlin to smithereens and that church is just like destroyed. And you think here it was this magnificent building and he's preaching. You could just feel the German pride on Reformation Day and Luther and where aren't we great, right? And he's trying to get them to wake up. And as if it was like, you know, a Jack Chick tract, like let's just make this real clear. That church was just destroyed. You can go there today and look at it in case you think those things could never happen, right? Because we think, well, that can't happen here. That's what they thought. Well, you referenced his speech on leadership right after Hitler had secured his power as the leader. And I thought that was such a good, because we've taken leadership and kind of coerced it into a CEO approach to our faith. <sighs> and the, the, the church, the, the, the good news in this is the church has the power to bring about a different outcome. If we will humble ourselves and repent, we don't need a fifty-one percent majority. Well, the Creator of heaven and earth is on our side. You, look, you're you're we you're, change. you're saying it exactly, exactly correctly. I there's nothing more sickening than seeing churches function as like corporations that they care more about the bottom line or about is some, maybe somebody will sue us or we'll get bad press if we do this. So let's just do the safe thing. The safe thing in those cases is usually from the pit of hell. There's no safe thing. Either you do what God calls you to do, which is your job, or you are serving evil. And I have seen this in American churches, and it is truly horrifying. I mean, I'm not a pastor, so I don't see it the way you see it, but it is horrifying to me to think that they are so foolish that they're they're worried about how are our numbers doing, or we just built this big building. And, we, and I'm thinking, when did you— when did you forget that you have to worry about what God called you to do? That if you don't do that, you have nothing. And I, you know, some people can't hear that or they won't hear that. But I really do think that if, you know, we can blame politicians, we can blame corporations, we can blame big tech, we can blame all. And, you know, we're we're right to see the malfeasance and the evil and the corruption. and the, But God calls his church to be different. He calls us to speak the truth self-sacrificially, even if it costs us our lives. We're supposed to believe Jesus defeated death on the cross, so we don't fear death. But are we behaving that way? And so when I see churches and pastors kind of functioning like that, you're thinking, this is this is a nightmare because it's exactly what happened in Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, here at Exhibit A, B, C, you know, it's not like this is theory. You can just look at it. You don't need any creativity. The parallels are stark. Yeah. But again, this discussion of the church to me, we, we think of the church as this separate institution led by pastors. And I think it's a misunderstanding. I mean, I understand the labels and the org charts. Yeah. But the church is the people of God. We bang that drum when it's convenient that, to us. That right. It's not about a building. Right. It's not about a structure or yeah. a hierarchy or a denomination. Yeah. We are the church. We are right. the living body of Christ. Right. And the way I think this this what I'm looking for is the people turning their hearts to God so that it affects the way they live so much that when there's a corporate gathering of the people, it gets reflected there. Yeah. And we've lost that side of that. It's easy to blame the institution and say, you know, right. we're to something. Yeah. But the reality is the people of God, we're a nation with a Christian heritage. We're ashamed to acknowledge it in public. We go to the university and say, you're not a Christian nation. And we rather sheepishly go, okay. Yeah, it's a lie. It's yeah. a misinterpretation. Well, exactly. The class is filled with people who are predominantly Christian, and they're taking their heritage away from them, and they don't even yawn. The, <laughs> the church has been absent. That's, I mean, man, that's that's a whole other uh, piece of this ugly picture. Um, I think, you know, l let's face it, the, it's a, it's a big mixture, right? You have wheat and tares. You have some people really hungry for this, looking for leadership to lead and, and whatever. And then you have other people who aren't. And I think that one thing I have seen is that those, and this is fascinating to me, but those pastors that have been particularly bold on this kind of stuff, on speaking into the culture, on speaking truth about anything, you could, I mean, there, there's nothing's off limits. We're here to speak about truth. There's no like, well, you can't talk about this and this and this and this. We're supposed to Talk about truth, about the reality of God's reality. 
Those who have been bold, most of those churches have seen their numbers dramatically increase, uh, which is exactly the opposite of what a lot of pastors are fearing that, well, if I bring about this, I'm going to lose people, I'm going to lose people. And, and so there's a great irony here because I do think there's a hunger in the church for uh, that, that kind of leadership. And so in the book, what I'm really trying to do is make the case to those that are maybe on the fence that they, they need, they're not sure what to think and they need a kind of a biblical case to say, God wants you to speak about politics. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be speaking only about politics, but the idea that, oh, I can't, I can't even mention this. Listen, if you're dealing with out and out more atheist Marxism, on the one hand, and something else on the other hand, and you say, but I can't really tell you who to vote for, that becomes preposterous. Like, it's a joke. We're not, we're not, this is not a choice, um, you know, between, uh, you know, Hubert Humphrey and Richard Nixon. We are talking about a new day where the Democratic Party is, it's not the party that we grew up with. So when, when you could say, don't be political 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that made a lot of sense. But if people are spouting craziness and you say, well, I don't, I don't want to, you know, some people believe in craziness. I don't want to, I don't want to offend them. How can you not read the times that we are dealing with aggressive, uh, the sexualization of children, things that if you are silent about this, because you're afraid somebody's going to look at you funny, how is God not going to hold you accountable for that? So we're, we are living in a new day and I think people, generally speaking, are so they're hungry for truth because they say this is this is all happening so fast. Where do where do I turn? And by the way, if you're interested in evangelism, I think there are tons of people who would not describe themselves as churchgoers or born again believers or whatever who are looking around. They're looking for somebody to tell them what the heck is happening here. I don't get it, and so. Those churches that are speaking plainly and lovingly about the truth of God on sexuality, on gender, on any of this stuff, their their numbers are increasing. So that's the irony is that that, that if, if you're worrying about your numbers, probably you're going to lose people to those churches that are not worrying about their numbers. They're worrying about, am I speaking the truth? Yeah, I would agree. And, and my experience supports that not just with the place where I'm serving, but in my conversations with leaders across the country. Uh, Psalm 37 says not to fret about evildoers. And I think that's a bit of a challenge because it's easy to look through the window and get pretty torqued up. <laughs> yeah. And that's not fruitful. And one of the things I liked about the book was you give us kind of a way to take the energy that comes from the diagnosis, which is a little intimidating. Yeah and express it in a way that helps us construct a better future. Yes. Which is what we have yes. to do. Yes, that is that is key. There's nothing worse than, uh, and I know I write about this in the book, that people who see everything that's wrong and complain about it and complain about it and basically either say or behave as though we're done, there's nothing we can do about this, so might as well just go to our caves and wait for the Lord to return. If you, if that's your attitude, you are as big a part of the problem as anyone else because the Lord is calling us to fight. He's calling us to speak. So when you take this fatalistic attitude and just say, oh, this is all terrible, it's all terrible, turn off the news, pray, get involved uh, in your community, do anything you can do, homeschool your kids, whatever you can do, do the right thing and God will bless you. Don't just think, well, I'm, I'm just, everything's so terrible. There's nothing I can do. That's the voice of the enemy saying, do nothing. It's over. I've already judged. I'm judging and it's over. That's not right. That's not right. Our job is to fight for the truth and to speak the truth until we can't. And I think a lot of Christians have fallen into that trap of just thinking things are so bad that uh, all I can do is talk about how bad they are and feel terrible, and what's the use, what's the use? That's the voice of the devil. We've got to know God calls us to hope and to action and to prayer. And, and that's, why, that's why I wrote the book. I am hopeful, but I want to exhort others to be hopeful and to fight with joy for God's purposes. I always appreciate that. You've been willing to tell the truth in your books, but you always do it with a note of hope and optimism. 
and you know, we wrap it into theology, even things may be bad, but the rapture is going to get me out of it. So I don't have to pay attention. <laughs> Jeremiah, when he's in the pit, you know, God's judgment's coming. The Babylonians are coming and he sends money to buy real estate. I love it. He's investing in real estate in Jerusalem while the Babylonians are building a siege ramp. Amen. And you're in your way. You, you've got a pilot for a new talk show. You've got a Bonhoeffer movie. I don't see you retreating because of the darkness. I see quite the opposite. I see hope coming from your life. I mean, I, I well, first of all, you know, b- when Bonhoeffer got engaged to get married, it was like a deliberate um, action of hope. He said, I'm not going to just cower and say it's over. And, and, and the point is, no matter how things end up, that's what we're supposed to do. So because we believe Jesus defeated death and that if I'm killed tomorrow, I don't die. I go into real life in glory. Like if we don't have that innate sense as we walk through these things, it is going to cripple us and make us stop doing things. But I, I have a sense that there are enough people who want to fight or who are going to wake up because think, things have gotten so bad. This is again, Romans 8, 28. Every nightmare that has come upon us, the Lord can use for good to wake people up who otherwise would have continued sleeping. And so it's an amazing thing. There's a holy remnant of people waking up who would have slept if things hadn't gotten this bad and convinced them like, oh, oh, I didn't realize. I thought we were just going to coast, you know, we're going to coast to the horizon. No, the Lord is calling us to wake up, to act, to do what we can do. So I am, I'm genuinely hopeful, but it's, it's kind of like the person who's, you know, you're, you're, you're in the middle of fighting World War II. You don't know where it's going to go, but you're fighting because you believe fascism, uh, totalitarianism, evil must be fought. And however it goes, I am not going to lie down. I'm not going to say, who cares? Who's to say? God has appointed me to this hour to fight and to do what I can do, hoping for for the future. So, yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of different things going on because I do believe we are going to get through this. It's a battle, but the Lord called us to this battle. Like this, there's no, you know, it's kind of like, ah, too bad. No, the Lord called us to this moment. Every single person who's alive now, we're called to this moment for God's purposes. So we shouldn't act like, well, this is, there's some mistake. Uh, so I, I, I am, I am, I'm deep, I'm deeply hopeful that definitely no question. Well, more than that, I think it's time to invest in the things of God. It's time to expand our footprint, to make a stronger step to whatever we can do to bolster our churches. You know, the temptation is to go buy dehydrated food and MREs and find a cave. Right. But I think it's the opposite response we need. We need a bolder step into the culture, um, bolder voices. Let's, Let's demonstrate that the church is alive and vibrant. We realize that's going to draw attention and some of it negative, but that's the nature of a conflict. Yes, well, there's never been greater hunger for truth. Let's just, just talk about that. When everything is going fine, uh, you know, people don't care. They're doing their thing. When things are not going fine, people are suddenly looking around and thinking, what's happening? Uh, I need answers. What, 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 why, uh, what, what is it about America? Was I, was, was I mistaken in, in thinking that there was something special about a liberty and what, you know, people are asking questions now that they were not asking uh, five and 10 and, and 20 years ago. That's an opportunity for the church. That is an opportunity. But if the church is just drifting along with the culture, then, you know, we don't, we don't reap the harvest. But I believe that's the Lord's will that we reap that harvest, that all these people looking for truth and answers, that they would find it in the church of Jesus Christ. So we need to be uh, extra vigilant, like right now in the midst of the madness. I did an a, a interview the other day. It was um, an anniversary of Mother Teresa's death, which happened to be coincidentally the anniversary of Princess Diana's death. And it was such a stark contrast to me in two kingdoms without denigrating Princess Diana and the kingdom she represented, but there's a greater kingdom. And our fashion is not as important there, but the benefits are a lot more eternal. And I think the church has lost that. You know, if I stay with your your book in World War II, for the Brits to continue the battle when London's being bombed to smithereens, 
you may win, but you're going to, you have to rebuild. And the church needs a little bit of that tenacity that this may disrupt our vacation. This may influence, you know, we're going to have to be in in a different way than we have been in his, you know, suffering at church used to be the sermon was 10 minutes long (laughs) and we're in a new world now. Well, that, that, that's what's so fascinating to me is like the Lord calls us to a life of purpose, to a life of meaning, to a life of joy, to, to like a joyful battle. I mean, what, are, why do we get to fight in the battle between good and evil on the side of good for God's purposes? What an unbelievable privilege. What a joy. It's why we were born. So the idea that I just want to have a life of ease, that's a joke compared to what God has for us. And so I do really think that's kind of what's happening now is that there are people waking up and understanding there's more, there's way more. Uh, and, you know, to miss that, that would be the tragedy. It's a privilege that we get to participate in what God is doing. And I think he's doing gigantic things right now and will uh, in the in the future. And we get to be a part of that. So it's a it's a glorious call to the church. And so that's part of the reason I wrote the book is that I don't want anyone to miss this. This is, this is, we need all hands on deck. We need to understand what's at stake. A lot is at stake. Everything's at stake. And this is our battle. It's more than a battle. It's a war. And, uh, you know, 20 years from now, 10 years from now to look back and think, what did you do then? What were you doing? You know, oh, basically trying to avoid service. You know, you don't, you don't want that. You don't want that to be what your answer is. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think we're living in amazing times, amazing times. Exciting times. Yeah. I didn't get to ride with Paul Revere through the streets of Boston, (laughs) but we got assigned to the 21st century and we get to stand watch and sound the alarms and do our part. It's, that's, that's the whole thing is that every generation, the Lord has his assignment for us to, to be in this battle. And I think that, you know, our generation, in a way, we missed a lot of that. Things have been, we've been so blessed. We've been spoiled that we've been lulled into this kind of, you know, into a, a, a stupor. And the Lord is using these horrors to wake us up, to bless us by waking us up, you know, to fight. So, yes. I think you could say that spiritually we're trust fund babies. Yeah. And of now course. we're the spoiled, weak, yeah. timid, petulant, all those negative images sure. that we would attach to people who are not us. Yeah. But we've inherited all this liberty and freedom and opportunity. And we just thought it was our birthright. Right. And it should be given to us in perpetuity. And we're a little offended that now we may have to actually do something in order to see extended. Well, that's exa- that's exactly right. And I've said this when uh I don't know if I was here talking about it, but my book, uh, Fish Out of Water, where I talk about growing up with a mother who's German, who grew up in what was Nazi Germany, which became East Germany, communist East Germany. My father grew up in Greece during the war, suffered, both of them knew hunger and all of this stuff and knew the evil of communism. And when they came to this country, they knew, hey, this is not normal. This is amazing. This is a, a gift from God. This is an opportunity. And they raised me that way. And so I was raised with an innate sense that evil is right there. This wonderful world is not normal. And people have died for this. So I really want to, to bring that sense to, to people who have grown up in this wonderful nation to say, hey, folks, this is not, not everybody has had this. My parents didn't have this. People right now around the world don't have this. And this is something, it is a privilege to fight for this. It is a right. privilege. And and for us to be able to live here and to be able to talk about these things freely, people have literally died so that we can have this conversation. How can we take that lightly? Why don't we pay a price? So now is an opportunity for us to pay pay a price, whatever that would be. And sometimes that just means, you know, speaking when people say, well, you can't say that. And you say, well, yeah, I can, and I will, and it will bless people. I don't know who, but it doesn't matter. That's in God's hands. So to, to even to pay any price, to be able to p- play a part in this, you know, centuries long battle for truth and liberty, it's a glorious thing. And so it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. And, uh, I, that's, again, that's kind of the point of the book is to, 
is to get people to understand this is a beautiful opportunity. This is not some bummer. This is this is a good this is weirdly a good thing if you look at it through God's eyes. Amen. Well, my guest today is Eric Metaxas, a best-selling author. His latest book is Letter to the American Church. Uh, it's an encouraging read. It's an important read. It's a book you want to give to somebody else after you've read it. Uh, it's time for us to wake up. Eric, thank you for your tireless efforts on behalf of liberty and freedom and our Lord. It is always just a great joy to be with you uh, and to be here. So thanks for letting me be a part of this. I, I honestly um, appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. Amen. 